Conference agreed this is on the record. We usually do Q&A as well the record, but this is on the record. Uh, good. Anybody with a question? Uh, uh, Martin, I, I wouldn't thank you, but uh, my question is this. Having lived through the whole of crisis and the aftermath, my question is around, over the long run, would we just better off that we don't, that we're all Europeans, we're part of the European Union, but that we say, you know something, to Euro just inherently a single, a single currency in a place like Europe with all these different countries, with different growth rates, different population rates, is just not sustainable and that over time, no matter how, how well we fix up in terms of these adjustment mechanisms, but it's just with all those inwardly combust like we did in Ireland and like they did in other countries. Or whether or whether it's possible for Europe to become a federal system like America with a true European thing. It doesn't test the the European the economic cohesion so strongly. It's it's a good question. Uh, and I think maybe I'll stand so that I can see everyone ever can see me. Um, the premise of your question is that the place we're at now can't hold together. And that's what I'd like you to reconsider, or at least uh, not take for granted. Because you're, you're suggesting that we have to either get a much more unified sort of Eurozone politically, or we need to find some way of going back to separate currencies, maybe not all national currencies, but at least kind of similar countries in the similar, uh, in the similar basket, if you like. Uh, and you, you talked about how there's a risk of combustion, and that's what happened here. Now, Iceland combusted just as spectacularly as Ireland did. Uh, the form the crisis took was somewhat different because Ireland was in the euro. Iceland had its own currency. But what I'd like you to, uh, um, what I'd like you to consider is a proposition that most of what went wrong had little to do with the fact of the euro itself and a lot more to do with choices, political, <coughs> regulatory, economic policy, that a country could also get wrong outside of the euro, and that there's a lot of post hoc over proctor hoc going on. It's very easy to blame the euro, partly because the form of the crisis management is tied into eurozone structure, which it had to be. Um, but it doesn't seem to me reasonable to think that Ireland, with its own currency back in the early 2000s, would have fared any differently from Iceland with its own currency. Similar policies, similar current account deficits. Um, why are you blaming the euro for it? I suppose I, I witness, like everybody else, a massive <coughs> inflow of funds from you know, Germany, Belgium, Holland, and all these places because here there was the attraction of high returns from property, low euro rate interest rates. So, one hundred years. Can you put in place anything to stop that massive flow of funds into countries like Ireland, where you're part of the Europe? Right. Well, uh, first, let me just say that I just mentioned a couple of other places where the same thing happened. I've already mentioned Iceland. Let me say Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Turkey. Um, no, I'm thinking of some eurozone countries here. Florida. Right. These things happen in many types of currency regimes. So you're quite right. That's the root of the problem. I want to first point out that this happens with or without a currency union. And second, you ask exactly the right question, what should you do to stop it? Well, I think, for example, you should uh, use regulatory powers more intensively to stop banks from lending recklessly. Right? There are lots of things, and you actually have probably more tools now, probably had them back in 2005, four, four, five, six, two. but now at least central bankers and regulators know about them. You can increase capital requirements, equity requirements, you can do various forms of macroprudential regulation. You could go quite radical and put limits on borrowers, um, the legality of somebody borrowing too much compared to their income and so on. You can force more financing to take the form of uh, equity type financing where it's the investor who loses when things go badly. So all of these things you can do, you probably could already the last time around. But certainly, it's easy to do now because regulators are more conscious of it. And if you think about what banking union does, uh, it's one aspect of what it does through the bail-in rules is that it kind of starts to make debt look a bit more like equity because the debt will be written down. Right? The whole debate about senior bondholders. Here, the system has now been established 
whereby that kind of marketable uh, bonded debt should really be treated a bit more like equity. The investor just write down, writes down the value when things go bad. Uh, so there are, there are ways of dealing with this within the euro. Before going to a past finance minister, do you think the politicians of the 1990s would have gone ahead with the creation of the euro if they had been able to see 20 years in the future? Uh, by 20 years, you mean which <coughs> year exactly? Yeah. So they, they, they'd seen the first 20 years of the euro. If you said, uh, yeah, if you said up to about 2008 or 9, I guess the answer would be no. Um, Give it five more years, give them 25 mm -hmm. five years, um, and I think they might have. But just, just on that, um, I think that if the politicians who decided on banking union back in 2012 had fully realized what they were signing up to, I don't think they would have done that. Uh, so I'm sort of using a parallel to your question to mention an important point about banking union, which is that the effect of the long run will be to separate, in a sense, the bonds between national politicians and national banks. Uh, because, uh, well, governments won't be allowed in the same way as before to rescue their banks, which means that you will have write downs, you will have changes in ownership, you will have the emergence of a more pan-European, pan-European owned banking system. And so it will gradually, I think, erode this link you see in pretty much every country between political elites and banking elites or commercial elites at the national level. That's one of the, I think, deepest effects of banking union. And that will take time to play out. But I don't think it's one that politicians were consciously signing up to. Give up um, political control of their banks, basically. I started off about 180 degrees different from the previous question. Uh, I don't think that the record of the European Union member states in the period when they had national currencies was any better in terms of uh, mm -hmm. coordination or, or cohesion uh, than, than it's been since. So I, I'm not sure that having national currencies really makes any difference to what actually happens in terms of the objectives that towards cohesion. It is a fact that when the crisis hit, we did not have a bank resolution system in the European Union, and in a number of member states, including particularly Ireland, we didn't have a banking resolution system. So that's changed. Um, even in a single currency area, and I think both regulators and borrowers need to examine this, there isn't any objective reason why interest rates should be the same all over the area, because risk factors are different. And my question really is, do you think with the instruments that we have now and that we're probably about to have, would a Troika in future make any different kinds of proposals to a country whose banks were in difficulty? Now, I know that um, the, 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 the cramming down of senior bondholders is now part of the system, except if you're Italy mm. recently. You know, so that isn't really quite a key yet. But do you think that a Troika might make better informed decisions and, and leave us with a situation where we didn't have a kind of a permanent eternal outlier like Greece you know, constantly as a bore under the sun? I think, um, you know, the way you ask the question, I will at least claim, grants one of my claims that a lot has to do here with how decision makers use the decision power they have within the existing structures, uh, which is why I argue that actually it's not so much about fixing the institutions as about just making the right choices when you're faced with a problem. You're, you're right about there not being bank resolution schemes in place um, when the crisis hit. Uh, so of course to, to do what I think would have been the right policies, you would have needed legislation that's want to be put in place, I'll just note that uh, even Ireland, Ireland itself showed that you can pass legislation overnight when you have to. Uh, by February 2009, the UK had a proper bank resolution law, which could have been, I think, quickly adapted or learned from for the Irish context, if that had been the political choice at the time. So, you know, you kind of, you often make the tools you need, and you can make them quite quickly if, if you decided to do it. Um, 
national governments remain actually quite powerful, more powerful than they're often given credit for. So that's sort of a, a general observation. Would a future Troika behave differently? Um, well, I would hope so. Um, I think we have some new tools in the sense that, as you say, Balin is now part of the system. Yes, it didn't happen uh, in Italy. But part of that was a choice from the uh, European level regulator to leave this in the hands of Italian regulators. That was a discretionary choice. So I think one thing we want to watch over the coming years is again, how do the people with the power to make the call on the night actually use it? So will, this will not be politicians, but probably technocrats, regulators. Will they establish a practice and a precedent that means that you bail in when you should bail in? I hope so, uh, but again, it's hard to pin this down completely in law because there will have to be some discretion. Um, so a lot of the political work to be done, I think, is to create a situation where it's seen as politically possible and objectively right to do that. Um, the other point I want to make is I think everyone's learned a lot from the crisis. Uh, and this, so let me bring in, I said I wanted to mention Portugal. Uh, after they came out of the Troika program, they've done quite a lot of things that fly in the face of the standard Troika prescription as of 2012-2013. So they, for example, raised the minimum wage. And uh, I'm not as familiar with the, uh, with the Irish reform programs and then with the Greek, for example, but clearly that was a big issue in Greece to, uh, to not do that and even to, to lower it, I think. Um, so in Portugal, they've done They've sort of taken a social democratic, kind of classic social democratic turn without being too vocal about it. It's worked out quite well. They've brought down the deficit, but they've done so sometimes by raising taxes rather than cutting spending. As I said, they've increased uh, the minimum wage. It seems to be working out all right economically. So I think there's, the next time around, there'll be a much, I think, a more open-minded uh, view among the people who will make these decisions about what policies are good policies. So th this is the big problem with saying we need to impose the right policies on countries in trouble. The, the, you know, back, back in the crisis, the central level wasn't that good at picking good policies. Uh, I think we've learned some lessons about what the best policies are. Patrick? And I just want to ask you about how you see what we might think of as a political transition in Germany mm. affecting the future trend. You said probably if there are reforms this year, there'll be sort of German-type reforms, uh, but not very strong. But uh, over the years of the crisis, the role of Germany was, was very strong. First of all, because they were creditors, but also I think even in the personality uh, of, of uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, yeah. who was there, had a strong personality, clever fellow, and was there right through for nine years when everybody else was coming and going. And, and he was able to uh, say no to a number of, of things that should have been done, and he would be replaced by somebody who is not as secure and uh, not as, as dominant. Uh, and there would be a huge tra transition in German politics. Will this, this make Germany weaker in de de defining where the euro is going, or will there be no change? One thing that Schäuble famously said was that you can't have an election just uh, mean that the policy changes, right? About Greece, that was. Uh, it seems to me that the new German government is applying the same dictum to Germany itself. <laughs> because I think Olaf Scholz said that, you know, that uh, it's not Schäuble anymore, but you know, many of these policy tends to remain in place. Which of course makes you ask, what's the point of, of elections? But, you know, if there's a consensus uh, for these sorts of policies in the population, maybe it's warranted. I, I, I don't want to judge that, but just in terms of prediction, will, will anything change? German had outsized influence because there was a crisis, right? Uh, it was a combination of two things. It was that there was a crisis, decisions had to be made one way or the other. And some of them, if they involved transferring money, had to be done unanimously or as good as with Germans' consent, Germany's consent. And the other thing was a widely shared belief that you couldn't have a Eurozone country restructure its public debt. So that was an axiom in 2009, 2010, basically until 2012. Um, 
or late 2011 when the public <coughs> private sector was the private sector involvement in the Greek debt uh, restructuring was decided. Um, now, as I read it, um, if you think about 2011, so by the time it was too late for Ireland. In the Greek case, Germany was one of the countries actually pushing for a public debt restructuring and no further bailout of Greece before private investors had been, uh, had been restructured. Uh, so I, there is a the common view that is to some extent right, that things went worse than they should have done because Germany was too recalcitrant at a lot of moments. There's a lot of truth to that. But I think there's also, uh, I think it's also true that back in April 2010, Things would have gone better if Germany had been more recalcitrant and said, no, we're not actually going to do any bailout of Greece until there's a restructuring. So an earlier restructuring in Greece would have made everything quite a lot better, I think. That's, that's my view, that's what I set out in the book. So, so yes and no. Um, you know, at the very early stages, I think Germany is to blame because it wasn't tough enough. It gave in to particular French pressure uh, to you know, for what goes by the name of solidarity. Um, putting money in uh, to try to solve the problem, stem the crisis, stop the capital flight and so on. Um, and that works until it turns out you need so much money that you don't really have enough, as you all know very well here. Um, we're not in a crisis anymore. So I think Germany's role in normal times could be quite different than in a crisis. And I think when or if there is a financial crisis in the future, when, uh, but hopefully not in a long time, given the new rules that are in, are in place, I would think uh, it would be a little bit harder for Germany to play as obstructive a role as it did at some points in, in this crisis. Part of that will be because the bail-in system will make things easier for governments, because you won't have these public sector balance sheets back in the whole banking sector. Uh, partly maybe because now, in this round, Germany will get in some of its preference about automatic or semi-automatic debt restructuring or maturity extension for public debt, so that actually the question won't come up in as sharp a form, whether you know, the creditors have to bail out the debtors or the northerners have to bail out the southerners or whatever <coughs> politically toxic form it tends to be phrased in. So I'm cautiously optimistic, I would say, that things could be better in the future than now. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Dan. Um, my question is about Italy. Mm -hmm. um, in this first period you're talking about, Italy is going to be trying to form a government. Um, out of the various um, impossible or improbable combinations for that government, um, the major participants, at least those who are likely to be a government, are all in favour officially of risk enhancement, as the Germans would say, rather than risk reduction. Mm -hmm. They all want to break the 3%, they all want to um, go uh, against uh, that part of the deal. Um, and Lega Five Star in particular, which perhaps is now just about the most likely new government, um, does want to do that. How do you see that playing into the benign process that you've described? Yeah, I hope you'll give your answer afterwards because you know Italy better than me. Uh, I note that the Five Star movement has uh, pedaled back quite a lot on its stances on, on European policy issues. Euro and so on. Um, I mean, I, I, I have no idea what will happen in terms of forming a government and so on. Um, I find it sad that because of the political situation Italy is in, it can't really play a role in the debates that are happening now on this Eurozone reform issue. So it won't really have as much influence as a country that size and of that importance obviously should have. On the other hand, if they were to have that influence, they would also have to form it into proper policy, and that's hard. Um, I think there's. Um, I, I I think, and I wrote this recently, that there is actually uh, you can you can see some room, if politicians at all sides wanted it to happen, for some kind of understanding between Germany and Italy in the context of eurozone reform. And it would take the form of a Italian government ending its resistance to bail-in, embracing bail-in even, 
uh, in return for a reform that gave a bit more flexibility on fiscal policy to national governments. So, if you like, centralizing more banking policy, for banking decision making, and re returning, redevolving some fiscal autonomy to the national level. Um, for that to happen, there would have to be quite a culture change, I think, in the Italian political class. I mean, I think it would be good for Italy to embrace Spain and kind of separate out, do some restructuring of the banking system to put the legacy problems to one side and allow the banking system to lend to more promising businesses. Uh, that would be good for growth. It would paradoxically fit in well with the five-star rhetoric uh, of taking down all the elites that have uh, driven it into the ground, which has some merit. They haven't done that. <laughs> I think they should. Maybe they will. They've changed, it seems, uh, their views on the euro. Luigi Di Maio seems like a pragmatist or opportunist, depending on how you see these things, when you want to think the best of people, but not a dogma dogmatic ideologue. So maybe it's possible. But I think you can see the possibility of that. I don't think it's likely, but I think it would be good for the Eurozone, it would be good for Italy. Um, but no, that's not very probable. So what is probable? I, I guess continued stasis and sort of semi-stagnation. But I hope you will give your view too, because you, you followed it for a long time. Well, anything that's going to happen will take quite a long time. Mm. Uh, and therefore, my view would first of all be that um, the sort of process of decision making about Euro governance that you've described is going to have a lot of Italian uncertainty going on around it, probably for six months, I mean, for a long time. Uh, because even if, I mean, I agree with you about the bail-in versus fiscal trade-off. I mean, that should be, in principle, attractive to both five-star and the league, more five-star than the league, but possibly both. Um, but to actually get there would take you a long time in you know, a new government anyway. So it's going a scare in the bond markets that would come from the form of forming of that new government and a lot of rhetoric about higher fiscal spending that will come from the form of that new government will nevertheless disturb the process that you've described, I guess. Um, in terms of what's going to happen politically, uh, actually I'm not sure I am any better at guess, guessing that than you are. Um, I think that Five Star as a league is the likeliest mm -hmm. uh, outcome because it, it has a political uh, logic to it, even if it doesn't entirely have a policy logic. Um, but the, the kingmaker is the <coughs> defeated party, the, the left wing, the centre left, the Democratic Party. They are present doing just what Schultz did in Germany and saying, no way, we're not having any part of this, we're going to be in opposition. You can imagine the same process going around in Italy, and they finally come back and form then a more moderate administration. So that the place to watch in some ways is the PD, rather than the, uh, as you say, moderating that cases. Yeah, but in the meantime, everyone else will have made up their mind on, on these rules and reforms, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Brendan. <coughs> yeah, just following on. From that, you made a number of, of statements about politics in the Eurozone. Uh, so just one of them then to pick up on, you said that if uh, political support for the Euro declines, then the Eurozone would break up. Or I don't know whether you said could or would. Uh, I have my doubts as to how that could happen uh, and how easy a process it would be. So could you expand a bit on how, how, how could that happen? You know, in r real life, uh, given the the structure of the euro and what it depends on it now, you know? Yeah, I didn't mean to say that it, it would lead to that. Uh, I, I think I didn't say anything about what it meant, and I'm glad yeah. you're pushing me to say, what, you know, what, why does it matter whether it has political support, is a sort of pointed way of rephrasing the question. Uh, I would say that it matters inherently. It would be a good thing if people trusted the institutions they live under as a sort of general democratic point. Um, but in terms of the effect, I, I think I would say that in a crisis, in a future crisis, there would be hard choices to make, there would be losses and pain to distribute. That's what crises do. You go from a point where you think everything looks nice, and it turns out things won't be as nice as they looked like they would, and the politics is all about 
how do you allocate the burden of this shortfall of the previous expectations from what is possible. And that's not just, that's true in any financial crisis within a single country, too. Uh, you could tell the political story of the Eurozone crisis as one in which it took a very long time for politicians to be willing to make those choices about where the losses fall. Um, in a future crisis, where things are difficult, if you start from a point of view where public support for the Euro uh, is already very low, eroded, it seems to me that it's more likely that a movement that not just says, you know what, forget it, stuff it, stuff your euro will leave, but also means it, unlike here I have in mind Syriza, uh, would actually come to power. It would be, I just think that the, the probability that the uh, reaction to what would be partly for real, partly perceived as being hard choices imposed from outside, uh, that the reaction to that would be to turn your back and, and leave. Uh, it's not a very different story from what people thought might play out in, in Greece, for example. Um, I just think that back then many of us probably underestimated the support that despite everything the Euro had, um, and that if that support was uh, thinner, lower, when going into a next crisis, that the probability of uh, the population of the government is going to be this high. I don't think I think I haven't convinced you, but I'm not. I don't feel particularly convinced myself. I, I think one should distinguish, particularly being Irish, <coughs> between the risk that some small peripheral member state leaves yeah. the eurozone, Ireland or Greece, and there might have been some small risk of that either. Uh, that's one thing, but that doesn't end the euro or break up the euro. And breaking up the euro is a different thing altogether. And I, I, as we saw both in Ireland, and I don't know uh, the risk that there was that Ireland might allow itself to be pushed out of the euro, maybe some non-trivial risk, or the risk that Greece might be. But neither of them, at the end of the day, left even Greece. Uh, but the euro wouldn't be over if, if some country like uh, of our size or Greece's size would leave the euro. Um, so the breakup of the eurozone, um, that's a, a much bigger thing altogether and I'm not sure at all that it would be an easy process in, in any way or, or that it could easily happen or even, uh, I think, but I'm not, you know. Yeah, you well, know. well I think, so I took your question to be about the possibility that one or several countries leave the eurozone, but specified in that way as yeah. the whole thing disappearing. Yeah. Uh, I think I agree with you, I don't. I don't really see how that would happen. The only way I could see it happen is if uh, Germany, essentially, that public support for the euro in Germany becomes so weak. Why would that be? Well, it would have to be some public opposition to the sort of policies Germany goes along with. But Germany is a democracy. Right? In spite of the things we just said, if there are policies that Germany, that Germans don't want Germany to participate in, then Germany will not participate in it at the end of the day if the opposition is great enough. And that will not break up the euro, as, I, as I've argued. If no German money had come on the line at all, that might still not have broken up the euro. It would have forced public sector restructurings and so on. And there's no way to kick Germany out of the euro. So I think, I think we agree. I mean, I think I can't tell a story by which Germany would leave the euro either, because it could always just stop doing the things in the euro that the general public wouldn't want it to do. On that immediate, yeah. Yeah, just on that, on that point, um, it's true that, you know, uh, during the Euro crisis, the Euro came under the greatest pressure to break probably in the way, and it didn't break. Um, and Greece remained a member. And I just wondered, what, what, was, what is the single most important reason why the Euro stayed together at that time, um, and is that is that still a factor that will keep it together through future crises? Countries were even joined throughout the crisis, um, so it's even it was even stronger in that sense than, uh, than how you describe it. Uh, I mean, I'd like to say 
I would, I would like to say that the reason was because people understand that leaving the euro will not do anything good for them, even economically, that the economic problems are not the fault of the euro itself. Uh, I don't think that's the reason. I think the reason is political, and it depends a bit on which country you're in. Uh, in the countries, I won't speak for Ireland because you have to, but uh, in a case like Greece, I would I would interpret it as a sufficient number of Greeks seeing, having joined the Euro as a symbol of kind of that level of having arrived, if you like. If you think about the whole process of European integration from the end of dictatorship, joining the EU, and ultimately also joining uh, the Euro as sort of political graduation, if you like, into the ranks of core European countries. Then, of course, came the humiliation of and mismanagement in the crisis. Uh, but I think <laughs> that importance of the euro of being part of you know, the kind of core European system that more or less worked continued to be important enough for enough people. Yeah. I mean, what they wanted was different policies inside the euro, obviously, but uh, that argument that's legitimate enough. Yeah. Because that argument also played in Italy that um, you know, for, for Italians, the Italian establishment certainly, you know, joining the euro was a sort of foundational, fundamental act of being European, um, but I think the Italian political establishment still is convinced of that, but the business establishment, which may or may not have bought into the Euro on day one, mm -hmm. has certainly lost its um, faith in the Euro, I think, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know, it, it seems to me that Italy is a kind of prisoner in the Eurozone. Um, for a whole lot of internal Italian reasons. I would suspect that if uh, the Italian banking system was properly sorted out and started lending more liberally, business would feel different <laughs> about it. Uh, and I don't, I don't know really what business thinks, and I suspect it's different between big companies, certainly exporters, manufacturers, and smaller companies. But in terms of popular perception, Italy is interesting and worrying in the sense that of all euro countries, it has a lower support for the euro, no, noticeably so. Um, and I think among the crisis hit countries, one reason might be that unlike the other countries, it didn't have this very recent memory of coming out of dictatorship and, and so on, unlike Spain and Portugal and Greece. That was much further in the past. So that wasn't a reason, right? Uh, it had already been an important uh, country. And, more successful, more uh, well-functioning country than was always before them. The other, of course, is that the crisis there, in a sense, has lasted much longer. There has been a lack of growth, zero productivity growth, certainly compared to its peers, for about 25 years. If you look at sort of 93, 94, seems to be when Italy stopped keeping up with rich country peers. So there's been uh, there's just been a very long period of malaise, and it's, it's natural, I think, incorrect but natural to link it to the euro. Okay, we're coming to the end, so we're going to take three, oh, maybe four, um, together. Um, one there, two there, and one here. Uh, it, it could be argued that the Fed responded more quickly and more efficiently to the crisis now. Prices were bigger for the United States than Europe. But I think it did uh, respond quickly and efficiently relative to the uh, ECB. Uh, and you asked the question, why was the case? And I think uh, for a number of reasons, and perhaps the most important reason is the objectives that the Fed has, which it got under the former Federal Reserve Act, are far broader than what the ECB has. And secondly, uh, uh, Bernanke, I think, had read Friedman and Schwartz's monetary history of the United States and understood what happens mm -hmm. when you have a type of crisis that hit the United States in the 1930s. And so, in the United States, they introduced quantitative easing uh, very quickly. Uh, and it took some time for the European Central Bank uh, to do that because it was obsessed still when the crisis broke with this uh, idea that they were there to control inflation. Inflation was there, financial instability was there. And they just didn't have the, the, uh, the knowledge uh, and the background and indeed the range of objectives to, 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 to come quickly to the issue. And so quantitative easing was 
introduced at a relatively later stage by the ECB. Now that seems to suggest to me that we're talking about reform of the uh, Eurozone. We need to get back to, uh, to Maastricht and have a look at that and sort of say, hey, we do need far greater flexibility uh, than we have uh, in the uh, Maastricht Treaty at the moment. It, it could be that they've learned by doing it, but that's, that's not specific to the objectives that are there in the uh, Maastricht Treaty. I'm going to take them all together and we'll wrap up. Okay. Yeah, uh, I wonder if we could take it to a, a, higher, a higher and, and broader level, and that is that uh, both uh, in public and in private, the international financial system is grossly over leveraged, and uh, the um, quantitative easing of the last uh, few years uh, in the American budget. Um, Mario Draghi is saying we do what it takes has in fact made this problem even worse and uh, makes the Italian problem I think look even more uh, serious and more difficult to deal with in, against that background. Uh, now I know that one of your colleagues in the Financial Times uh, said that the setting sin of macroeconomists was that they thought they could predict the future. Um, nevertheless, it, it is, I think, necessary to consider what the future will hold first, and does not the whole uh, euro problem look uh, less simple to deal with against that kind of background? And finally, Kieran. Just uh, you mentioned you were going to uh, say something about Portugal. I was interested in what the treaties there might be. And very finally, uh, following the geography, do you think the more positive uh, scenario for the Eurozone might encourage the Danes and Swedes to rethink the membership? So ECB financial system and yeah. uh, I, I addressed Portugal in one of the other questions. What I had in mind was how after they came out of the uh, monitoring system, the Troika monitoring, that they have adopted uh, quite a few policies that go very much against the grain of the sort of uh, Troika view of what correct policy is. So they uh, they raise the minimum wage, they reduce the deficit in by raising taxes rather than cutting spending. Um, a more classical social democratic policy, if you like. And it's had certainly not bad economic effects, maybe good economic effects, but there's no evidence that this was a bad policy when you actually look at the results on the ground. Uh, so what I meant was that it's provided a kind of example, counterexample, if you like, uh, that I think will become more important in the, in the intellectual development of how policymakers think. There will be a case you can point to and say, well, actually, why, why do we need to force a country to reduce the minimum wage when Portugal will show that you can raise it and have good results? So, so that was the, uh, that's what I had in mind. So were you taking more questions? Did I interrupt you? Or? No, there was that, but the Denmark, no, that was it. Yeah, then, then then Denmark, sweet. Yeah. Um, let me talk about the ECB questions first. Um, now, it's a very pertinent observation that uh, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England started buying uh, securities in large amounts, quantitative easing, in March 2009. The ECB must at the time have considered it or seen it as one possible option a central bank can pursue and decided not to. They had a sort of micro version of it, but they decided very much not to do the same as the Anglo-American central banks until six years later when they started, pretty much exactly six years later. Uh, I think, you know, to tie in with, uh, with your question, <coughs> I think QE made things better because QE, I think, doesn't increase leverage but kind of shifts leverage to a place where it can sit uh, in an effective way that makes the leverage that exists in the private sector more easy, easier to deal with or at least sustain while also uh, investing in uh, growth friendly kind of activities. Uh, leverage is a really important point because partly I think it supports the claim I made earlier that this is there's nothing specific, not much specific to the euro in this crisis. It was a banking and financial crisis resulting from excessive leverage. It was the same in the US, it was the same in Iceland, it was the same in the UK and it was the same in a lot of eurozone countries. The form, the fallout takes is different if you're in a common currency. But it was the same 
more or less the same origins. And of course, the countries where that leverage has led to a huge external deficit, current account deficit, I think the worst. It was always thus. Uh, so leverage is bad. Uh, what do you do with it when the crisis has hit and it can't be sustained? You basically have a choice between deleveraging by cutting lending and cutting activity, or by so reducing the flow of lending, if you like, or by cutting the stock of existing debt and restructure in the banking system, in the private sector, in extremists in the public sector. Uh, I think for the first few years, the Eurozone chose the, chose the first, um, and that went badly because that squeezes the economic activity for which you can so extend. Whereas the better decision would have been to cut the stock, do debt restructuring, and allow new flows to continue. Um, why didn't they do QE earlier? Um, I think it's less to do with the mandate itself, which if you read the full mandate, there's a lot the ECB can do and is indeed required to do. It has to prioritize inflation, but so long as inflation is under control, legal treaty text says it has to support the union's economic policy, which, you know, you go to Article 2 and 3 of the treaty, includes a balanced social market economy, inclusive employment, all of these good things um, that the Eurozone didn't really pursue for a couple of years. So there was plenty of legal justification, I think, for the ECB to say, we need to be more expansive and we should be QB2. So my best interpretation of why they didn't uh, is largely intellectual. So I'm kind of with Keynes here that uh, academic ideas actually have a lot of power uh, in policy making. Um, I think that it was not seen as appropriate for the ECB to engage in large scale asset purchases. Uh, partly, this is a tradition I think the the Fed and the Bank of England had more experience with throughout their longer lives, whereas monetary policy in the ECB was based on collateralized lending, not so much direct market intervention. So there was perhaps a bit of a kind of intellectual hurdle there. And there was a worry about, is this monetary financing? Um, but I think it was largely an, an intellectual, the intellectual frame had to be moved there was a, a frame that made it hard to contemplate these things. Partly that was also the interpretation of the mandate. That kind of moved over time. I mean, you, can, you, know, you can read speeches by Draghi and colleagues over the years, 2013, 2014, 2015, laying the groundwork for engaging in proper QE. And it worked. Um, what does all of this mean for the future of the Euro, including with other countries, will other countries join? Uh, I don't know that Sweden will join the Euro, but I'm pretty sure it will join the Banking Union. Uh, I think Denmark will also join the Banking Union. Certainly the political classes in both countries are quite positive about it, so there's sort of political maneuvering process uh, to go through. The Denmark is, for most purposes, a member of the Euro already. Came to the Deutsche Bank since 1982, if I'm right. So maybe it doesn't make that much difference. Uh, I think perhaps the more interesting question is, well, these European countries join the euro. Bulgaria wants to. Um, I think probably in time, yes, maybe not under the current governments in places like, uh, like Hungary and Poland, but I think in time, economic logic will, and political logic, more importantly, will lead them uh, to do that. So with all of that, um, because I've argued that there isn't as much wrong with the euro as such as the standard narrative has it, I think that the future for the euro is bright because I think there, is, there are fewer threats to it than people think so long as policymakers make the right choices. Whether they do or not doesn't depend so much on the structure of the euro as what they've learned, what future politicians will do in a crisis. But I do think that when anything is seriously undervalued, uh, underrated, it will usually outperform expectations. So that's my bet for the euro as well. Good. Well, on that Thank sort of happy, happy note, um, we might end it there. Thank you.